Okay, sorry. Well, it was designed to do these kind of things. It was designed to be programmable, and it was designed to work at a frequency that made it very fast compared with hand calculations. In fact, making a multiplication in less than three milliseconds is much faster than what you can do by hand. Okay, then. The, but the problem is that it was using vacuum tubes. What does it mean, vacuum tubes, in this case? Okay, it means a lot of power. You need to use a high voltage, low reliability, with a high manufacturing cost, very large size, and probably a limited lifespan, which means that it will break very easily. By the way, do you know, have you ever debugged a problem, uh, a program? Do you know the expression debug? No? In Spanish, we call it depurar. Okay, and in, uh, in English, what they use is, let me write it, yeah, okay, it's debug. Okay, and what, do you know what a bug is? An insect, yep. So debug means removing, no, it's not an error. Actually, the word comes from bug, which is uh, some kind of insect, okay? And the, the word started to be used because of the first computers were using cables inside, and from time to time there were insects inside making the cables not working. So debugging means looking for all the, the insects that are inside the machine. Okay? So and it was actual the actual meaning. And then debugging started to be used in order to get the errors outside of a program. But in fact, initially it was mean to, it was meaning getting all the bugs outside of the machine. Okay, so it, this is curious, curious things. Yeah, no, yeah it's, uh, as, uh, as I told you, it's nice to know where you come from. Okay, but then, because of these problems, the people were using, well, were looking to get other things that could be used in a, in a more profitable way. And people were thinking to use things that were not based on, on the thermo thermoionic effect, because the thermoionic effect needs high, a high voltage to heat the, the filaments. And this means you are wasting a lot of power just to, to heat the filament. So people were thinking to use something that was the discovered many years ago, more or less in the at the beginning of the of the century, more or less at the same time that uh, that sorry that Fleming discovered or patented the thermoionic valve. They were playing with something which is called solid state. What is solid state? Solid state is another way of saying semiconductors. Not exactly another, another way, but it's similar. So in, uh, in 1926, this guy, Julius Edgar Lilienfeld, patented some things that were very similar to the modern devices we are using, which are MOS devices. Okay? And these are the things that he, pat he patented. Okay, he was a quite interesting guy. Okay, first, the first thing he patented was this structure here. Okay, you see, you have a source, you have a gate, sorry, a drain, which is then similar to a resistor, and then you have something which is the gate with a short key junction, which is some kind of a diode. 
This is very similar to a bipolar transistor. You remember, you put a current inside the, the base and you get a car, an, uh, an amplification of the current between the, the drain and the source, okay? which are called the, uh, the emissor and the drain. But okay, anyway, that it's, uh, it's the, same, the same idea. The problem is that this device has a power flowing through the, through the gate. And then he patented another device, which is more similar to the MOSFET we are using now, which is this kind of thing here. Okay, it's a, because it included an insulator between the gate and the channel. So there was no current flowing through the gate. And this is much more interesting because you don't dissipate power in this case. Okay, questions by now? No? Okay. And then, many, some years ago, the, that was during the, the 20s. However, the, in this case, the idea was very good, but the technology was not. So people were not able to fabricate these kind of structures. So they went through the, into the refrigerator. Okay, so they were there and people were not using them because they were not able to fabricate that. And then people continued, was using still the, the vacuum bulbs, the vacuum tubes. But they were not efficient, so they, they were having problems and so on. And the ATT Labs, the main phone company in the United States, was investing a lot of money in order to get some alternatives to these kind of things. And they had very good people working on that. And in, uh, in 1947, Bardeen and Bratain but, uh, discovered something that was called the point contact transistor. Okay, they were working under Shotley, which is this other guy here. It was a, a team of three. Well, in fact, I, it's not true. They, they were not a team. Shockley was the was the boss, and Bardin and Bratain were the were subordinates. But Shockley wanted to get to keep all the all the merit for any invention they made. So the other two were not happy with that. So they discovered the point contact transistor without shortly knowing but then shortly uh, was quite upset about that okay anyway in uh, in the 1947 they discovered that and then one year later shortly discovered the junction transistor which is what we, we are using right now okay, and this led to a nobel prize which which was shared between the three of them okay so this is quite quite nice Okay, here you have a, a picture of the first device, and it's a, it's, how to say that? Let me try to see, I don't know if you can see it, but here, this is the gate. With the, in this terminal, you are controlling the voltage you are applying here, and the current is flowing from this to this other point. Okay, so it's some kind of point contact transistor. That means you are making a physical contact between the, the, the gate and the terminals. Okay, if you wish, afterwards, I would like you to see this film. It's nearly one hour, but it's very, very, very interesting. It's in English, but you can also put the captions. So this is gonna be mo much more easier. But it's very interesting in order to get an idea on how electronics developed and how all the different companies were born. So it's, uh, in fact, it's very fun. I, I, I did like it very much. And I recommend very much that you see it. Will you see it, please? Tell me yes, please. Tell me, tell me yes. Yeah. Even if you're lying to me, Wait, wait one second, I have to find you. Where are you? Yeah. 
You will? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Now, now I'm happier. Okay. But then people was very happy about that. Okay. Have you ever heard about the Roswell incident, by the way? No? Haven't you heard? Haven't? Never? No, don't, don't you know the Roswell incident? Oh my! I can I cannot believe it. Okay. Yeah, then I I I think check that in the internet in two minutes, please. You have one minute to check that in the internet. Roswell, New Mexico. OK, check it, please. Just out of curiosity. Is the if you look at the Wikipedia, this is direct. OK, you remember it. OK, and then there is the, the conspiracy theory, which is very fun to, to remember, that all these electronics development were done to inverse engineering, to reverse engineering the thing that it was assumed to be found there. OK, this is an argument that doesn't hold anywhere, because if you have uh, something if you have a, an UFO, you can rest ensured that they will not be using this kind of technology they were using. In fact, most probably it, it wouldn't be possible to reverse the technology to, to get these kind of things. Okay, so it's, it's just ignoring history, saying that all this came from, from aliens. Okay, but anyway. It's just something that came to my mind now. OK. But then people were not happy using only, only transistors. And they were looking for, for more complex things. Because, OK, you know, you have a, a transistor, you have, which is something much better than an integrate, integrated circuit. But then, what you do, do what you do do what can you do with one one transistor the, the, you cannot do many interesting things with just one transistor if you want to do computing you need thousands hundreds of thousands millions of transistors but you don't need only the transistors you need to interconnect them you need cables to interconnect them. You need to power them, and you need some substrate to put them on. OK? So by the 50s, they were having a problem that was called the tyranny of numbers. And it, that was meaning that they knew how to design very complex designs, very complex circuits, but they didn't know how to fabricate them because the integration, the cables, the physical substrate, the power was a, a very big problem. And they didn't know how to go, how to cross this wall. And then in, uh, during uh, a summer time, Jack, Jack Kilby, who at the time was uh, just a freshman outside of college, went to to, the, to work in a company, ATT, and curiously, it was summertime. Okay, so everybody was going out on vacation. So he he got to be alone for more than one month in the lab. Okay. There was nobody to tell him what to do, and he had to be there because he he was new. He had not accumulated 
time enough to get some vacations. So he was alone for one month in the lab. And during this month, he developed the, the idea of the first integrated circuit, which was something just with one transistor, three resistors, and uh, one capacitor. It was a phase shift oscillator, which is some kind of, of circuit. OK, so it was the first integrated circuit. But then, this is not what we, what we are using now. What we, we are using now is something more complex that was developed by, oh, sorry, by noise, which is the other guy. Which one of, of both do you think is more, okay, is more fun? If you had to choose one of them as your professor, which one would you choose? Would you choose? <laughs> Me too. Somebody would choose Kilby. Anyway, Kilby was a very, very interesting guy. Also, he was uh, ultra Christian. I think he had more or less one, do one, uh, more or less ten. 10 or 12 children or something like that. He was uh, quite curious. But Bob Noyce was, in fact, the one who invented the, the integrated circuit, the actual integrated circuit. And more things. In fact, he, he should be, he should have had two Nobel Prizes. He invented uh, the two, yeah, he invented the quantum junction uh, tunnel diode. And he also invented the planar process. But he was dead by the 90s, so he didn't get the, the Nobel Prize. But he was probably more worth of, the, of it than, than Kilby. Well, not more, but at least equally worth of it than Kilby. But he looks a, a funny guy. OK, the, so what Kilby did was getting all the circuits inside the same substrate and then putting some cables inside. So predefining some kind of, inter of, of integrated circuit. What noise proposed was getting all the transistors fabricated on the same substrate and then getting a metal layer to interconnect all of them. The idea is, is much better pro than, the, than the other one. I mean, because Kilby was different discrete elements and putting them together over the same substrate. What noise was proposing was fabricating directly the, the, integrated, uh, the, inter, the, the integrated components into the same substrate and then interconnecting them using a metal layer, which is, which is what we are actually using today. Not only one metal layer, we are using up to 30 metal layers. But anyway, the idea is the same. We will see it later. OK, so what we are using now is noise process. But it was done by other, other people. And then just two years after that, Fairchild and Texas Instruments started selling integrated circuits like, like, uh, okay, like, like, like what we are saying today. Uh, today. Okay, if you have time, also, maybe you would like to see this, this film which is how Jack Kilby discovered the or invented the integrated circuit. In fact, it's, it's, a, it's only a part of the history, but it's curious how, it, how he did it. OK. And then we go for the, for the history, because now we are already in historical period. During the 60s, Everybody started using MOSFETs because they were easier to fabricate than, than bipolar transistors. They discovered how to do that, and they forgot about integrating bipolars. Because some guys called Atala and Kang fabricated the first MOSFET using the ideas from Fleming from 40 years before. And then they started using silicon because they discovered that the, the uh, silicon on the outside was a very good isolator. So that solved 
many, many different problems uh, that we will see when we talk about manufacturing processes. And in the 63, Sylvania started com selling MOSFET-based circuits, which were faster than bipolar and with, uh, with a, a lot less power consumption, which is good because you can integrate more gates into the same circuit and get more complex functions, which is very good. Okay. And then in the, in the 60s, they started fabricating these MOSFETs. And then in the, in the year 64, a guy called Moore. Do you know this guy, this guy Gordon Moore? Have you ever heard of him? No? Yeah? Moore? Yeah, Moore. Gordon Moore. Uh, do you know a company? It's a very small company. I don't know if you if you have heard if you have ever heard of it. Do you know a company called? How is it the name? I, she, I don't remember. Ah, oh yeah. Have you ever heard of Intel? Have you ever heard of Intel? Yeah. Really? You know Intel? <laughs> Never. A little bit, yeah, okay. Okay, so Gordon Moore was the founder of Intel. Okay, so he was a very good engineer. By the way, do you know what, what what's the common point between the founders of Intel, Google, Microsoft, Alphabet, and all these kind all of these companies? Do you know what's the common point between all of them? Even Tesla, Ford, General Motors, you know, you know, all of them are electrical engineers. Okay, so now, now you know what's expected of you. So you can build multi-million, multi-billion dollar companies. You will have the knowledge of how to do that. Okay, so this Gordon Moore, made an observation that the number of transistors in a circuit more or less doubled every two years. Okay? Yeah, do you understand the idea? So he made an observation that said, oh, look, this is curious. The, for the same area, every two years, we get the, num the double num uh, uh, twice the transistors. Oh, that's curious. Okay, but then they were in this time occupied designing the the first microprocessor, which is the Intel 4004, which was a microprocessor with four bits. Now we are we have 64, so it's okay. But then more, the Gordon Moore's law, Moore's law, still holds valid. Okay, now we will see it in a in a few minutes. But from the 60s, from the 70s, the, the electronic field exploded. Okay, so we have microprocessors, memories, we have whatever you wish, even solar cells, we have ev everything. And just to, get, to give you an idea, a feeling, is what, how, the, how the aspect of integrated circuits has been evolving during these years. This one was the first integrated circuit by Jack Kilby. It was done by hand, with some kind of resin and with different elements, with some cables put by hand. But it was the first integrated circuit. One year after that, Fairchild developed this kind of logical circuit, logical gate, with many, many different, many transistors, maybe 10 or 20 transistors which was very good because it was a, an import, a very important reduction in both power and area and connections for the for the designers then in the 64 they were using another circuit which is this kind of oscillator you can see there are more transistors okay not this one this was the 
the bipolar. Okay, this is another thing because we were using here bipolars, but this is not what I wanted to see to show you. That this is a picture of the first microprocessor from Intel. Okay, 2,300 transistors in the 71. Some years before I was born. So I'm, I'm younger than processors. So this is good. OK, so okay. How can, as you can see, it has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 inputs. OK, 16 inputs. How many inputs do you think we have now in a microprocessor? OK, some hundreds. Here, this is the Intel Pentium 2, which had, that had more than 7 million transistors. Yeah, you cannot see the individual transistors. In the other one, you can still see the, still see them. Here, you cannot see anything. And then, seven years ago, this int, the Intel Core i7, which is most probably what I have in my computer, something very similar to this which has nearly 2 billion transistors. Here you cannot even see the, the single interconnections. You can only see some different blocks. So, and this is what we are going to, to do in this course. Not the Intel, but we will know, we will discover how to design this kind of from this schematic. Okay, so we will know how to draw these kind of things, because there are rules that teach how to do that. And then this is Moore's law. As you, guess, uh, you, as you have seen, the number of transistors has been increasing. Okay, so this is what Moore said. Is a is a, an empirical observation that said this that every two years the number of transistors gets doubled. Okay, so this is just an empirical observation. But some people didn't understand that as an observation. It was a kind of joke calling that the Moore's law. And some people started to believing, started to believe that it was an actual law. Okay? And so they started to make the, the company forecasting based on, on Moore's law. So they, they started to put money to make the, the law true. Okay, so they started to put money into research and development to make this kind of thing hold. And it has hold for nearly 50 years, which is quite a lot. So that means that starting from the 70s up to, the, to now, we have gone more than seven orders of magnitude in the We have increased more than seven orders of magnitude in the number of transistors. However, as you can see, the number of transistors has been increasing, but all the other performance parameters have gone, have saturated. Okay, for instance, the single thread performance has got to, the, to some physical limits. The frequency is, has also get to some kind of saturation near some uh, some two, three gigahertz, four gigahertz. We are, we cannot go faster than that because then you start radiating too much power and you are losing power. The typical power also gets to some kind of limit because we don't, we cannot dissipate it, it fast enough. But the number of logical cores is still, is still going up. Okay, now I remember when the dual core was uh, a breakthrough and now I have in my comp in my single computer I have mo most probably eight cores so things are going up quite quite fast but then this is probably the the way to go getting up the number of cores or getting up the number of parallel circuits that are working together okay questions any questions by now no 
Yeah, a very good question. Anybody may guess an answer? Victor, can you guess an answer? Since you have the question, do you have an answer for that? Okay, so let's think a little bit. What's the difference between having, uh, for instance, yeah, the other parameters are getting better. I mean, the, the number of cores, if, if you look at it, you can see that the num number of logical cores started to rise when all the other parameters started to saturate. Okay, and this is why the number of transistors is is getting is keeping is keeping rising. Okay, but why why do we why do we need to increase the number of transistors? Which is, finally the number of transistors is just uh, an, an indirect measure of how good your system is. Okay, so have you ever heard about I don't know, neural networks, or I don't know, have you ever tried to play to a, to a game in a computer which is 10 years old? Or is there any difference between the computers at the, at the U, UIB lab and the computer you have at home? Yeah, the, the, there are some differences. Yeah, and they are basically the difference are, are based on the technology they are using. So the higher the number of transistors, the more powerful your computer is, because the number of, of transistors is also a measure on how big the memo, your memory is, or how many different functions you can put into the same uh, integrated circuit. Okay, for instance, a mobile phone from this year is much more powerful than a, a, a phone from uh, 10 years ago. Okay, and you need to to keep increasing the power of the of all the different electronic systems because the the requirements the user requirements keep increasing. So you need to provide more and more computational power to the user. So this is the idea of getting the of increasing the number of transistors. Okay, it makes sense? Okay. It, it's, in fact, is the, there is also a saying in the industry that now we are having more transistors than we know what to make of. Okay, so we don't know what to make of all the transistors we have. Okay. So silicon space now is very cheap you can make very complex circuits, but the problem is that most probably we are not using it as efficiently as, as it can be used. So we are having this kind of bottleneck now. We have, more, we have lots of transistors, but we don't have the, the techniques or the, the intellectual framework that allows us to use all these transistors in a very efficient way. So we are start. We are working on that. Okay, and maybe we are going. This is why we are talking about bio-inspired circuits and things like that, which are neural networks and many, many different things that are quite, quite fun. Okay, and then using Moore's law, the all the industry is making making forecasts. For instance, this is the international roadmap for devices and systems. Okay, this is something that people gets together and says, okay, let's have some beers and talk about what the future holds for, for all of us. So what we will be trying to develop for the next 15 years. So we know how to, how to invest our money and what we have to look for. 
then many many very many good people get together get drunk and then start things about different things and what we will do in in 10 years and there are here many different things for instance let me and here the most important thing is the size of the of the transistors because the, the smaller the transistors the more transistors you can put in a in the same system okay so this is why one of the reasons why you are trying to reduce the gate or the size of your transistors now the nominal size is more or less five nanometers okay five nanometers as uh, something uh, as a reference do you know which is the wavelength of the green color no make a wild guess which is the ra the range of the of visible light no okay the range for visible light is between more or less 300 nanometers and more or less 800 nanometers okay three between 300 and 800 so now we, we are currently more than 100 times below the way the visible wavelength which makes many different problems and this is why you cannot see a single a single device using just light you have to go to to other techniques okay and now we are we are at this point at five nanometers and it's expected that by by the by the end of this decade by the by the 30s we will be around one nanometer which is very 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 small which we are nearly at the atomic level which is which makes things very complex and it's so it, it's gonna be fun working there okay and they and here you have something which they are calling logic device structure options so you can see thin fit gate all around in fact lateral gate all around and lateral gate all around 3d so it seems that by the end of the of the decade everybody agrees that the lateral gate all around is going to be the the killer now we are using thin fits do you know what a fin is aleta okay perfect fin is the thing that the fishes have on the on the back okay good thanks Gian Giuseppe okay but then okay and this is just to show you the how they are how the different providers are working okay so they are everybody is trying to get as low as possible but for umc which is curious uh, can you see this one the last one here that they are showing uh, that they went from 14 nanometers to 22 nanometers in a planar technology but this is different from from uh, finfet to planar because they are going to to different things and, uh, and i think that they sold the technology to another one by the way do you know which one is the biggest chip maker in the world make a guess why why do you say that Juan? Why do you say TSMC or Samsung? 
I'm curious. Do you know what ARM is? What is ARM? Because ARM, in fact, are not chips. ARM, in fact, are only selling the intellectual property to make some some very specific functions, like microprocessors, inside different circuits. But they, in fact, are not fabricating. In fact, uh, two or three weeks ago, it was they were selling ARM to NVIDIA. And this is all related to the quest for in, in, for artificial intelligence. So the things are moving very fast in this field. But let me show you this. Because in fact, oh, what is it? Uh, okay. I think I have it. No, I don't have it. I thought I had it somewhere. Okay, I will. I will show you. But in fact, okay, here, here I have it. One second. And I'm showing it to you. Can you see this? Okay. So the first company. is Intel, then Samsung, and then TSMC was the third. Okay, but this is selling many different things. And then Nvidia, that was before they bought ARM, now they probably they are getting out, up. And then TSMC, which is Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing. Okay, but just to get the idea, Intel is, is still the first. And they are going up. Even with, uh, with all the coronavirus crisis. Okay, well, anyway. Anyway, we are going to, we are trying to follow Moore's law in order to get more and more functions into the same circuit, which means get cramming more and more transistors inside the same the same circuit, which is quite a lot of of money for research and developing new techniques. And then it's also a lot of money when you have to change your process from, for instance, 10 nanometers to seven nanometers. Do you know how much a foundry can cost? I mean the place where they are manufacturing the integrated circuits? Can you make a guess on how much can it cost to make a, a building for that? To make a manufacturing unit? unit? Make a guess. Make, make a, a wild guess and then put two zeros on it. Anybody, please? 
uh, just put one one and then and then start putting zeros. One zero more. Okay. Which which kind which which uh, in dollars euros. Okay. Uh, no, in fact, that would be correct if it was kilo dollars. Okay. So a new a new manufacturing center for integrated circuits can be up to one billion dollars. Okay. So you need to fabricate quite a lot of integrated circuits in order to, to recover this kind of investment. And moreover, notice that you don't need all these kind of things, all these late, latest technology nodes for many things. You need this kind of latest technology nodes for very specific things. You need this technology to put more intelligence into your mobile. You need that to, put, to get more intelligence into the network. Whenever you need to put more functions, you need to go deeper inside. But for other things, you don't need to go to these technologies. For other things, uh, you keep with all the technologies that are proven enough. For instance, have you ever heard about electric cars? I assume so. Yeah. So, do you think that the that the power units, the power transistors that are controlling how you are, con how, how much power you are putting in, into the, the motor are using this kind of technology? The answer is no, because the power dissipation here would be too expensive and it wouldn't make sense. They are using all the kinds of technology that are not focused in reducing space, which is not a requirement in this case, but they are focused on reduce, reducing the power dissipation and uh, the equivalent resistance. So they are going through another absolutely different path. So whenever you need to make power control, usually you don't care about size, but you care about other things, power dissipation, for instance. Okay, so this roadmap is for for Logic, logic, logic circuits or analog circuits uh, up to a point whenever you need to integrate functions, different functions, not when you need to integrate, for instance, power. Okay. So, and this is because when you get to a smaller circuits, you get less parasitic elements and more speed and less power dissipation, which is good, but you get to a maximum power that you can control because your elements are so small that they cannot dissipate more than a maximum of power. So you keep with all the technologies. Okay. And then, as I told you, we are close to the end of the road. Okay. We are getting close to the physical atomic size. So we can, it's complex to make a smaller transistors. However, I have to recognize that this is something that I have been he hearing since I was your age, not so many years before. But uh, we, I have been hearing that we are close to the red brick wall uh, since I was 20. So this is more than 20 years ago. This is, this is Jean-Manuel Serrat. I've been hearing for more than 20 years that uh, since I was 20 years, this. Okay, so the, this, uh, this is very popular when you are getting into, into electronic conferences. So this, you, are, you have, oh, sorry, <laughs> you have this more more, which, is, which means simply following more solo, which means integrating more and more transistors into the same circuit. 
you get also something which is beyond CMOS or beyond Moore, which means getting all the things that are different from the transistors. For instance, that means changing the, archi the architecture and not going to von Neumann machines and going to, for instance, neural networks. Do you remember what a Neumann machine is, von Neumann machine? Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah, so now people should, is, aware, is well aware that Neumann machines are very limited because the, there is something very complex having memory and processing separated. And now people is starting to get what they call computation in memory or non von Neumann architectures. They are making different devices that can be that can work with that, and everything is bio inspired, which means inspired in how the human brain works, which is one of the most efficient computing devices ever discovered. So most probably this is beyond CMOS. So, so they are they are working. We in fact we are working on these kind of things, so it's quite fun. And then there is also other, another thing which is called more than more, which is what I was telling you about. For instance, there are many things that you don't need to, to get more intelligence. You need to get more capabilities into the circuit. For instance, you can get more intelligence by adding sensors. You can add more intelligence by getting more life, more, more communication capabilities or getting all the devices like, for instance, flexible electronics or printed electronics, which, which is something that you can print at home and make it work. But you can have many different things that are not strictly more or more or getting only more circuits, but getting many different capabilities into the circuits. OK, so these are the three ways to go. The three ways the industry is going now more and more which is simply putting more and more and more devices into the circuit. But this is something that we are very close to the end of the road. We can go beyond CMOS, or we can go more than more, which is simply getting many other different things inside. OK? And this is what I was telling you about the FinFETs. OK, so this is uh, how transistors are evolving. Initially, okay, let me. So initially, oop, uh, I have to get here. Okay. So we started using this kind of bulk technology, which which is the the thing that was developed by by Fleming. Then this was the bulk, and then we got something which is called soy, which is silicon on insulator, which had less the power dissipation. And also less, uh, it was easier to fabricate, not easier to fabricate, but you could, you could get smaller transistors. But then the thing is that the gate, which is the important thing, was limited because it was a planar dimension. Okay, and the important thing for the gate is, okay, let me see myself. Okay, the important thing is how, how big is the distance between the drain and the source, okay. which means this is how much you can control the, the transistor. So we thought, OK, so let's get this up and let's go to the FinFETs, where the gate is all this thing that goes here. So you get a much bigger gate, a, big, a bigger control, but getting the same size, the same actual size of, of the transistor. So you get, a, you get a smaller equivalent gate transistor. So this is the bulk. Then they go to the SOI, to the silicon insulator. And then the obvious transition, the obvious evolution of the of the FinFET, you know what they call FinFET, because this reminds a fin. And then the, the actual evolution is getting the gate all around transistor which is a transistor, which is, oh, sorry, drain and source with the gate all around the, 
the transistor. So they are making different kinds of structures, lateral, vertical, and so on. But this is what we will be using for the for the next maybe 10 years. Okay, so this is what people is working on now. Okay, questions? No? Okay. This is simply what they are planning to go after that. Okay, they are planning to go, okay, we have one layer, but then what we can stack more and more layers, one or the other. That would increase incredibly, just putting one layer over the other one doubles the density. This has some problem for power dissipation, but okay, they can be resolved. Okay, but this is all, this is the, the net way to go. 3D integration. This is something that has already been done by Intel and also by other manufacturers by getting the, for the flash memory. They are doing 3D integration. But this is something that has not yet been done for, for other things. They can do that for flash memories because they are all the, all the regular. And so this, this is good for the, for the interconnections. But for arbitrary circuits, this is not so, so straightforward. Okay, questions? No? Okay. And then just to, to show you the evolution of the clean rooms in, uh, in 50 years, more than 50 years. By the end of the 60s, you can see people were not very, not very worried about what they were wearing in the, in the, clean, in the clean room. So it was just a normal lab, people with the, uh, with the hair like that, and okay, it was not not very not very work. By the end, by the middle of the 90s, people started to to use many complex things. For instance, this is they were wearing this kind of suits in order not to get a single spec last outside the body and into the fabrication processes. So just to make a comparison, by the end of the 90s, we were using transistors were more or less 0 0.1 microns in size. Okay? And then a speck of dust can be less 100 microns. So can you imagine what I expect that was what some dust can do for the fabrication process? So dust is mortal for a fabrication for the uh, for dye manufacturing for circuit, for integrated circuit manufacturing. So people takes a lot of cautions in order to do to get so clean rooms as possible. Okay, so they, they are spending money for that. Okay, so finally, okay, as a takeaway, the size of the devices are reduced by a factor of less 0 0.7 at each generation. This is what has been happening in the, in the last 50 years. Now, the, the most correct way to, to say that would be say that the number of local forms in a single circuit is that is duplicating every two years. Okay, this is more correct than the, num than the size of the devices. That was the initial formulation of the of, of Moore's law, but now it's not the same thing. So that means that the cost function reduced because once you know how to manufacture these functions, if you have the number, the, the number of functions, you will just double the power of the integrated circuit by the same, for the same price. But we don't know how to do that. We don't know how to design circuits with, the, with so many circuits, with so many gates than, they, than that. In fact, we are in a very similar position than when invented the, the integrated circuit. They were having something they called the tyranny of numbers, which was that they were 
they were able to design very complex systems, but they didn't know how to fabricate them. Now we are just in the opposite way, in the opposite position. We know how to fabricate very complex circuits, but we don't know how to design them. Okay, we have some techniques that we can use, but we cannot ensure that they are the most efficient way or that they are that they are no that there are no errors. So moreover, we are increasing the number of integrated of, of transistors in the chip, but we are not doubling the number of engineers dedicated to design them. By the way, do you know how much money is uh, an, inter, uh, an IC designer, an IC engineer earns per, per year? In the States, he is a little bit less. Uh, an engineer can earn there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I assume that you don't know, but guess. How much money does a good engineer earn in Spain? 100 keys. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is what, uh, this is after five years experience. No, no, no. 100. 100 keys. 100 keys after five years of experience is a very, is a normal salary. 50,000 is more or less the entry salary. And if you are good, if you are analog, you can get easily to this kind of money. If you are digital, a little bit less because digital, there are more digital gay guys than analog guys. So analog is usually more than digital because it's more complex to, to design. Oh, I did hear myself. Okay, so these are good, very good salaries. Okay, so I think that's it for now. And on Friday, we will start on how to model, on how to use MOSFET transistors to design circuits. We will start seeing the, model, the circuit models, and then we will design basic amplifiers. Okay, any question for today? No? So shall we meet again on Friday then? Yeah, okay. Uh, by the way, will you bring your computers? Everybody has a computer, I assume. Yeah, okay. So please don't don't forget to bring your computers. Yes. And please, if you have time, I would like you to see the the two videos I have put you there. I think that they are also in the in the virtual classroom. Yeah, they are. So please have a look at the video of of the history of the transistor now that you ha still have time, and you will find it interesting. I think it's a history of passion, money, and treason. So it's quite fun. It's like uh, like having a look at Game of Thrones, but this one is real. Okay, so see you on Friday, and have a nice weekend, have a nice week, and so on. <coughs> okay, so see you. Bye. Thanks for thanks for attending. Thanks to you. Bye.